injuries and abuse across the state of Alabama. The attorneys, proudly sponsored by Hollis Wright and Couch, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the Hollis Wright and Couch Law Firm and host David Lamb. Hello and welcome into the attorneys. Appreciate you spending your Sunday evening with us for the next half hour. The goal here is pretty simple. Uh, put together a panel of experts that answer your legal questions and they don't mind if they are tough either. And they try to uh, make it easy for you to get in touch with them as well. There's a way that you can call, text, email. That information you'll find uh, on the bottom of the screen all throughout the program this evening. So we'd love to hear from you. Leading the discussion, uh, as is often the case, is Josh Wright of the firm Hollis Wright & Couch. Good to see you, Josh. You too. Hope you had a great week this week. I did. Yeah. Uh, we are this week talking about uh, injured uh, railroad workers uh, and their rights uh, and um, uh, what types of claims they may have. and. When we talk about topics like this, um, we bring on folks like Tucker Burge at Burge & Burge uh, in Birmingham uh, because these are experts that have tried cases all over the country related to this type of issue. And I think some of the stuff we're going to be talking about today, David, is the uh, rights that a railroad worker has uh, after they've been injured um, and how uh, the, the federal regulations uh, and federal laws apply to them. Um, some seven, eight thousand workers uh, are injured yearly in one mm -hmm. recent statistic that uh, we came across. So we bring guys like Tucker on to be able to answer a lot of these questions. And thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having Just me. Just quickly, tell us a little bit about your practice and how long you've been doing this type of work because I think that adds a little context to uh, why we bring you on as our expert. Okay, well I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Tucker Burge with the law firm of Burge & Burge. For 30 years I've been practicing law here in Birmingham and we have a regional practice uh, primarily representing injured railroad workers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what we do, defending their employee rights and uh, in this specialized area of the law, the Federal Employers Liability Act. Yeah. It, 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 in the state of Alabama, you, you can't hardly go anywhere without crossing a railroad track. <laughs> True. They're, True. They're a, a popular way we see oftentimes, and we've talked about this, how you know, the interstates and, and truckers traveling, um, cargo, but um, rail is still a popular way to, uh, uh, to get products from here to there, isn't it? Oh, it is. I mean, uh, freight railroads are still doing booming, booming business. Right. They can carry, uh, you know, the equivalent of hundreds and hundreds of trucks in one train. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so, so a good reason for us to have this conversation, just kind of from an overview standpoint, what specific protections or laws exist for those injured railroad workers? Railroad workers are not covered by state workmen's compensation laws. Instead, they're covered by the Federal Employers Liability Act, which is called FELA for short. Okay. It's been around for over 100 years, and it was in response to a public outcry of the fatality rate and gruesome injury rate among railroad workers. When Teddy Roosevelt looked at the statistics and found that the life expectancy of a switchman was seven years, he said, this is a public outrage. We've got wow. to make a difference. So Congress enacts this law that places the financial responsibility for injuries on railroad on the railroad you know who's in the best position to uh, protect the employee right. they're the best position to identify the unsafe conditions and make the changes necessary Tucker who, who is uh, this applicable to we're talking about railroad workers but what types of positions um, uh, would fall under that well everybody who works for a common carrier okay. uh, <clears throat> whose work affects interstate commerce is going to be included. So of course the big carriers like CSX, Norfolk Southern, BNSF, uh, Illinois Central, the four big ones in Alabama, as well as all of the short line railroads, even if they are not uh, in technically crossing state lines right. because their business is going to affect interstate commerce. They're going to move them yeah. from one railroad to another. So, so they'll be engaged in it. The uh, positions would be all of the positions of the railroad. The people who assemble and move the trains, that's the transportation department, the locomotive engineers, the conductors, the switchmen. Uh, it's going to include all of the maintenance personnel who inspect, maintain, and repair the rail cars like the machinist and the carman. It's going to uh, include the people who maintain the tracks. 
uh, the welders, the track laborers, and even the office personnel, mm -hmm. clerks, yeah. uh, supervisors, people who never leave their office are covered by this act. Is, is a, a FELA case something you think a railroad worker can handle on their own, or do they really have to seek counsel in order to be successful in these cases? I, I obviously believe that they need to uh, get counsel. If you have a serious injury, your financial future is at stake and for most people their their wages are their biggest asset mm -hmm. and you want to protect that asset. When employees hire on with the railroad they go through classroom training and the training teaches them about how you're going to do this operation and that operation. Mm -hmm. They never teach them at anything about what their rights are when they're injured. Mm -hmm. They never teach them about this is an incident report. This is how to fill it out. They don't teach them those things. And the employees at a real disadvantage because the railroad has claim agents, people who are specially trained uh, to defeat your claim. Yeah. And they're working against you, so you need to get someone to level the playing field. What, what is the statute um, of limitations, the time from the injury you have to file a lawsuit, generally under FELA? Well, the rule is three years, okay. three years from the date of the injury. Uh, courts have interpreted that statute to mean in the occupational disease claim where you don't know the exact date that you contracted asbestosis, for example. Um, the courts say it is three years from the date when the condition becomes known or the employee should know of the condition and its work relatedness. And this is really where railroads um, defend these cases, these occupational disease cases, um, very vigorously is on the statute of limitations. So if an employee believes they might have a repetitive stress or an occupational disease claim and they're not sure of what their statute of limitations is, they probably should call a lawyer right away mm -hmm. um, to find out, you know, what are the relevant facts that you know, when did my statute begin to run? Mm -hmm. You went down a pretty good list of railroad workers. A question we've got here, are all railroad, railroad workers covered under FELA? Well, not everybody who works on a train is covered because there are certain plant railroads like the Fairfield Southern Railroad here at the U.S. Steel Plant mm -hmm. that they're not common carriers. You and I couldn't hire them to transport anything for us. All they do is move rail cars around within the U.S. Steel Plant. Mm -hmm. And then there are some state railroads like the Alabama State Docks down in Mobile. Uh, that has gone back and forth. Mm -hmm. But as it stands now, they are protected by sovereign immunity, the you can't sue the king principle which protects states from certain civil liabilities. Do For those non-common carrier railroad workers that are injured, um, are they subject to comp, a workers comp under, under state law? The, the U.S. steel employees or the Fairfield Southern employees would be. Okay. The uh, Alabama State Docks employees would have to go through that state compensation. Okay system and get all caught up in that. Another reason to go get a lawyer yeah. uh, on these cases if you've been injured uh, or you think you've got a repetitive injury to make sure that you're properly assessed as to mm -hmm. what type claim to pursue. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. More of our uh, conversation here as we talk about the injuries to railroad workers. would love your input. You can call, text, email. We would love to hear from you. That information you see here. You can also find the firm if you are on Facebook. Just search Hollis Wright and Couch. You'll find them on Facebook. And if you are on Twitter, it's Hollis underscore Wright. Stay tuned. Second segment of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright and Couch, and thanks for watching the attorneys on Alabama's 13. Now, we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never need legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to this show or related to other civil legal matters, call, email, or text us to talk with one of our lawyers. You can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter to learn about important legal news that could affect you or your family. Or simply contact us by going to alabamas13.com and click on the attorney's link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us and for watching The Attorneys right here on Alabama's 13.
still an absolutely massive industry. Welcome back in uh, to the attorneys. Want to remind you as we welcome you back, love to hear from you. You can call, text, email your questions to us. Uh, the topic of conversation, protecting injured railroad workers and roughly 7,000 uh, incidents in last year. 233,000 miles of railroad uh, mm -hmm. in the United States applicable here too. So it, it, it's a massive industry, there's no doubt. Um, Tucker, I, I thought it would be helpful. Um, a lot of the viewers, we've done shows on workers' compensation and how that works in the traditional employment mm -hmm. setting um, and how that is a no-fault system where even if you contribute to your own injury, uh, you're still entitled to workers' comp. This law is totally different than workers' comp in several respects. Can you kind of compare and contrast the differences? They, they're totally different. This is older than workman's comp, mm -hmm. and it is a fault-based system. Um, but it is a complete compensation system so that the employee has to show that the railroad did something wrong in order to be entitled to recover. There's two basic duties, the law talks in terms of duties, and there's two basic duties that railroads have. They have a continuing duty to provide safe working conditions at all times and all places even if they don't own the premises, if they send you on to an industry to pick up a rail car, they have to inspect to make sure that it's safe and eliminate any hazards for you. And they also have a duty to comply with the voluminous safety statutes. You know, the handholds have to be secure, the uh, couplers have to work properly, the brakes have to work properly. You can't have trackside vegetation that interferes with uh, the employee's work activity. So you have all of those duties and you have to show that the railroad violated some of those duties in order to be able to recover. Which, you know, it's not enough just to be at work. But it's a reduced standard on what you have to prove. The railroad employee only has to show that what happened um, was even in the slightest part the responsibility of the railroad. Right. They even contributed, even in the slightest is what the Supreme Court mm -hmm. says. And uh, once they've done that, they're entitled to recover all of their damages. Instead of going to the state code for workman's comp and saying, well, the loss of an eye, here's a hundred weeks at whatever the average weekly wage is, the employee gets to recover all of his damages, pain and suffering, lost wages and benefits, medical expenses for life, that sort of thing. In included in that though is that the railroad has the, or the company has the ability to argue that the employee was partially responsible for the injury and reduce the amount that they can recover, do they not? If you rely on the continuing duty as the employee, you rely on a breach of the continuing duty to provide safe working conditions then uh, your negligence, if any, as the employee is weighed against the railroads and if they say that you're 10% at fault as the employee, then you'd only be able to recover 90% of your damages. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's absolute liability if, say, there's something on the locomotive that is unsafe. One of those safety statutes gets violated, it, it throws the comparative negligence out the window, and that's something that these employees who get hurt are not going to know about. Um, all of these statutes that protect them. Another reason why you go to a lawyer, and, and let's quickly add a little context to this conversation. We're talking about comparative negligence um, and when there's not a statutory violation. Um, and if the employee is proven 20% responsible, they can only recover 80% of their damage. In a traditional workers' comp case outside of the railroad environment, um, if I'm using a skill saw but I'm taking a guard off, I'm not using the skill saw appropriately, I accidentally cut my finger off, it's a no-fault system. There's no comparative negligence that that employee did something that was inappropriate. It's a no-fault system. You can recover 100% of your damage under the statute. So it really is totally unique and different and another shining reason why, and we can't underscore this enough, you need to get with a lawyer. You need to contact somebody that knows how to handle these, these railroad cases to make sure that the claim is being appropriately litigated for you and you know what all your rights are. Right. Uh, talking a little about the, the injuries there, a question we've got, what types of injuries are covered uh, by FELA? What are, what are the commonplace injuries that you see? Well, there's the traumatic injuries, the uh, broken bones, amputations, burns, ruptured intervertebral discs, those sorts of injuries. There's also repetitive stress injuries. Those would be the injuries related to uh, you're exposed to a stress that over time 
has negative consequences and causes your body to break down in some way. That would be uh, noise-induced hearing loss, carpal tunnel syndrome, spine damage from uh, whole body vibration. When you're riding on the locomotive yeah. going like this, it can have negative consequences over time if it's excessive. There's the occupational disease claims. Those would be the asbestosis, silicosis, mesothelioma, uh, solvent-induced uh, toxic encephalopathy. And those are all physical injuries of some kind. There's also one kind of emotional injury, even absent a uh, physical impact on you, that you can recover uh, for if you're found to be within the zone of danger such that you had a reasonable belief that you were about to be killed or seriously injured, and that would be the crossing case where you know, fortunately you didn't suffer any physical harm, but you thought the tanker you were about to hit was full yeah. of gas as opposed to full of milk or something like that. Yeah. Experts pretty significant in these cases. Well, you do need experts to show not only liability at times, and railroad employees are experts. I mean, they're the ones who know what happened, so crew members and stuff can uh, do that. There's also the economists that uh, is needed to do the projections. Employees recover their net lost wages, their after-tax wages, and so an economist can accommodate you in that way. And generally you have the vocational rehabilitation expert to look at what their uh, earning power was and employment prospects were before they were hurt and compare them to what they are after. Another question we've got, two-part uh, question, who can bring a claim again uh, under FELA and what kind of damages may be recovered? Typical case, the employee brings the claim only for themselves. There is no companion case for loss of consortium uh, for a spouse and so they bring the claim to recover their economic losses, which would be their past and future lost wages and loss of earning capacity, their loss of fringe benefits, such as medical insurance, dental insurance, those sorts of out-of-pocket expenses. And then there's the general damages for pain and suffering in the past, the future, permanent disfigurement, permanent uh, limitations, that sort of thing. And in the case of a fatal injury, it is the personal representative that brings the case, and the personal representative brings the case on behalf of the uh, surviving spouse and the dependent children. If there's not a surviving spouse or dependent child, then there's a step down, you go to the parents and so forth. But the damages that are recovered in that, those kinds of cases are for the pre-death pain and suffering, and then for the pecuniary loss of the survivor. So it's what were the financial contributions that the employee would have made to this person in the future um, had this tragedy not occurred. One of the things I want to cover after the break is how the attorneys are compensated in these claims and uh, how that works um, and, and whether the employee has a responsibility to make any payments towards litigation, that kind of thing, because I think that's an important thing to talk we'll, about. We'll get to that right after uh, our uh, second and final break of the evening. Uh, more of our conversation on protection of railroad workers. Uh, as we head to break, reminders of how you can get in touch with us. Also find the firm Hollis Wright & Couch on Facebook as well as Twitter. Stay tuned. The final segment of The Attorneys is coming right up. I'm Josh Firth with the law firm of Hollis Wright & Couch. When it comes to a lawsuit against medical professionals, it may seem like the law favors the medical community over the injured patient, and in many ways it does. While not every bad medical outcome is malpractice, it's important to know what obstacles you may face if you're injured as a result of poor medical care. So in tonight's Legal 411, we're answering the question, does medical malpractice really exist? The answer is yes. But if something is ruled malpractice, Alabama law limits the information that can be presented to a jury about a medical professional. Medical malpractice is defined as a doctor's failure to use the degree of care and skill that a physician or surgeon in the same medical specialty would use under similar circumstances. For example, a surgeon can only be judged by the standards for a surgeon, a dermatologist by the standards for a dermatologist. 
According to Alabama law, we have what's called the Alabama Medical Liability Act. This prevents juries from hearing about a doctor's past mistakes or malpractice that's occurred before, limits the scope of information available to the injured party, and prevents any mention of liability insurance which would pay a judgment, the very point of malpractice insurance in the first place. However, even with these restrictions, malpractice cases can still be won. The law protects both parties and provides access to the jury system for people who have been injured after poor medical treatment. That's why it's so critical to get legal help quickly if you face this situation. Please remember, your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright & Couch want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Thanks for watching the attorneys on Alabama's 13. Good information to know for sure. Welcome back. Our final segment of the attorneys, but the information is still on the screen for you to get uh, in touch with us. As we were heading to break, Josh, you're talking uh, about the uh, attorney compensation. Yeah, I, th I think two things would be helpful to add a little context to these type cases to the viewer. Um, one relates to how attorneys are compensated, and second, if uh, I saw that firm fact that we just let in with, uh, what happens under circumstances where the employer tries to uh, prevent an employee's right under uh, FELA to recover if there's been an injury. But first, let's take one at, one at a time. Let, let's talk about attorney fees first. Uh, it's just like any personal injury claim where they come in and sign a contingency fee contract and the industry standard is generally the lawyer gets 25 percent and the lawyer will advance the expenses of litigation. So the employee does not have to pay for uh, anything unless they recover. Is that true? Short of it, okay. And that's pretty consistent with a regular contingency contract. What happens, and I've heard of these circumstances where uh, when somebody's hired on, they're asked to waive their potential rights to recover under a FELA claim if they're injured on the job. Are those enforceable? They're, they're not. There's actually part of the code that says any contract to diminish the railroads, designed to diminish the railroads liability under the act is void. The Supreme Court has actually addressed that very contract before and said that's unenforceable. Um, one thing we do see are railroads, though they're not making them sign a contract on the front end, but after an injury is reported and they call the supervisor, the supervisor would say, you really don't want to do this. Your job is going to be jeopardized. Hmm. And so recently, some employee protection provisions, some whistleblower provisions have been added to the Federal Rail Safety Act, and those prohibit any type of retaliation like that. And for those kinds of claims, where the railroad does follow through and say, well, you reported an injury, so we're going to fire you for this reason or that reason. Not only can the employee get reinstatement, uh, lost wages, emotional distress, but can also get punitive damages up to $250,000 because Congress has decided this is the kind of employer behavior that we really need to stop. Yeah. Congress has done a good job, not just in this area, um, uh, but in eliminating uh, retaliation claims. Not to say they don't happen, but a lot of times, as Tucker can probably confirm, a, the value of a retaliation claim is more significant than some of the underlying claims. I mean, it, oh, there, there are teeth be. that are included in a lot of these retaliation claims. We've got about three minutes left and a question I want to get to here. My employer is asking me to complete a personal injury report and provide a claim statement. Mm -hmm. Am I require, required to do either of these? The employee should report his injury. There are work rules and most, most injuries are not injuries that are going to prevent the employee from ever returning to work and he doesn't want to violate some rule and get fired for not reporting his injury. So you should report your injury. You're going to have to fill out an employee injury form. You should be familiar with that form and you should probably call your union representative or an attorney before you fill out the report because you know what happened but you don't know which of the facts about what happened is important from a legal standpoint. Right. And you might leave something out that happened 
that you know you just didn't appreciate that it was significant at the time yeah. and that injury report form is probably going to be exhibit one in the trial right. uh, some railroads have loaded their report form with uh, you know pitfalls for the employee hoping that you know did you have a reasonably safe place to work well the employee thinks well I had never gotten hurt before so so yeah I'll check yeah well really that that's did you, was it reasonably safe on that right. at that time and at that place that's what's really important um, and talking to a claim agent and giving a statement yeah. you do not have to do that Right. You should not do that. There's no rules for that. These are professionals who will ask the same question over and over yeah. again until they get whatever they want. Less than a minute remaining time enough just for a final final thought, 10, 15 second final thought from you. Well, I appreciate that y'all having me here to talk about this. And uh, railroad employees who get hurt do need to know what their rights are. And all of us go through life thinking that, well, it's not going to happen to us. Mm -hmm. Um, but unfortunately, statistically, for railroad workers, we know that sometime in their career, mm -hmm. they are going to have to uh, right. contact somebody about an injury, and they should contact a lawyer about it. Dave, mm -hmm. the reason the 800 number's on the screen yeah. is for folks that have been injured, if they have, they've got limited time to file suit three years, uh, they need to call guys like this right here, right. Uh, Tucker uh, Burge, we can, we can have them evaluate these cases for free if they've been involved in this. So contact us, let us know, we'll get you in touch with Tucker. Great conversation, appreciate you being with us. Here's the information if you need to get in touch with uh, the firm. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you next week right here on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright & Couch. to know for sure. Welcome back. Our final segment of the attorneys, but the information is still on the screen for you to get uh, in touch with us. As we were heading to break, Josh, you're talking uh, about the uh, attorney compensation. Yeah, I, th I think two things would be helpful to add a little context to these type cases to the viewer. Uh, one relates to how attorneys are compensated, and second, if uh, I saw that firm fact that we just let in with, uh, what happens under circumstances where the employer tries to uh, prevent an employee's right under uh, FELA to recover if there's been an injury. But first, let's take one at, one at a time. Let, let's talk about attorney fees first. Uh, it's just like any personal injury claim where they come in and sign a contingency fee contract and the industry standard is generally the lawyer gets 25 percent and the lawyer will advance the expenses of litigation. So the employee does not have to pay for uh, anything unless they recover. Is that true? Short of it, okay. And that's pretty consistent with a regular contingency contract. What happens, and I've heard of these circumstances where uh, when somebody's hired on, they're asked to waive their potential rights to recover under a FELA claim if they're injured on the job. Are those enforceable? They're, they're not. There's actually part of the code that says any contract to diminish the railroads, designed to diminish the railroads liability under the act is void. The Supreme Court has actually addressed that very contract before and said that's unenforceable. Um, one thing we do see are railroads though, they're not making them sign a contract on the front end, but after an injury is reported and they call the supervisor, the supervisor would say, really don't want to do this your job is going to be jeopardized hmm. and so recently some employee protection provisions some whistleblower provisions have been added to the Federal Rail Safety Act and those prohibit any type of retaliation like that and for those kinds of claims where the railroad does follow through and say well you reported an injury so we're going to fire you for this reason or that reason. Not only can the employee get reinstatement, uh, lost wages, emotional distress, but can also get punitive damages up to 